let's start. So after some negotiation, I got a lecture this week uh, under the condition that I'll do some work that Ralph needs for next week. So that's nice because it fits nicely into what I wanted to do. So last week we started talking about weak measurements and just the measurement scheme in general. And now we'll see um, how we can apply them to this print post selection paradoxes and you'll see like all the derivations now uh, properly and nicely. So just to recap what the scheme was, it's like we have some state that we want to measure. Uh, we want to measure some observable on this state. Okay. which just corresponds to the measurement um, with this projected. Um, and this eigenvalues, right? Good. And the way to do this physically is to prepare some other state, some other system of pointer, which could be anything for now, in some initial state. We we'll let them interact. And they interact uh, G. So we can put hats on the observables. Okay, where G is the time of the interaction times the strength of the interaction. These are all parameters that we can tune, and we can also tune the initial state. We let them interact like this. And then we wanted to perform a measurement here, which is just this measurement, this post-selection, right? Oh, saying I project into this state or the rest. Oh. Right. And then before or after, it doesn't matter, right? Because it's separated. I'm going to measure here some observable C, which is so forth for position pointers. This is just a position. And then I kind of just post select data on getting the outcome. So we saw that after this interaction, right, so the state at this point, the joint state, after interaction, so U of T. So it could be written like this times M, where uh, G is bar, do I have H bar there? Yes. A, K, D on my initial state. Right? And then with, what I said is that if these vectors here don't, don't overlap at all, this is the regime of a strong measurement uh, because what you get then in the reduced state in S is really the, the mixture as if you had performed this projective measurement and forgotten the outcome. Um, and today we'll see what happens in the other regime, in the opposite regime, which is the weak measurement. Okay, but just to see, so you know, what's happening in the pointer is that now you have kind of a superposition of all this um, wave functions or states of this thing. So if you look just at the reduced state of the pointer, you get this mixture, right? So this kind of, this overall curve, like the sum of all these things would give you the probability of then measuring if C is, for example, the position of the probability of or measuring the pointer at this position. But now what we do is kind of post-select this 
So we have all this data, we do this many, many times. We do this whole thing, prepare the states from scratch, do it many times. We get this, this data, but now we only post-select on the rounds where here we obtain psi, right? Which means that we are we kind of sampling from this distribution in a very special way, and we can get strange things that we'll see. Okay. So let me just write what the state is after the post-selection. We did it before. And I call it... So it's the state of the measurement device when we got find the post-selection. So this is... 1 over square root of p. Where p is this? <laughs> Sum over k. Okay. So this is a state. This is true in general. Doesn't matter what interaction uh, you put here. And. P is just the norm of this, is this thing, right? Is the probability that the post selection succeeds? We'll look at it later. Okay, so now we're interested in looking at the case that is the opposite of the of the strong measurement. So it, in the in the case of this pointer that is like a particle in space, it will really correspond to the to like starting it in a wave function that is a Gaussian that's kind of very spread out, such that like all of this, all of these shifts corresponding to each of them will like move it very, very little so that the states still overlap a lot, and then we'll get nice properties. Okay. So this was all recap. And now let's look in practice what this means. And now remember what we have freedom to choose we don't know psi of S, this is a state we want to measure. The observable is also fixed, right? This is the thing we want to measure. The post-selection is also fixed. But we can choose B, we can choose C, the other observable that we measure at the end, and we can choose like this interaction, like G, yeah? and we can choose the initial state of the pointer, right? So. G. We can choose B, C, and the initial state of the pointer. Okay. And the first thing I, I, I want to do is to choose them such that uh, when I apply this unitary, Mm -hmm. So this is an exponential, and the exponential we can expand it in the in the like Taylor expansion, right? So the first term just gives us the identity. The second term, so it's it's this exponential, right? Gives us uh, ig h bar. And then we have all the other terms. So one of a pretty n k to the n k to the n applied on. Right, we have all of these terms. Um, 
And I want the regime where this thing can be neglected, okay? It's so small that we can neglect it. Okay, so now I'm just saying that this is the condition that I want to impose. Um, and, let, and now we'll see what this gives us. But in the meantime, let's just keep track of all the conditions we have there on the right. So like, I want all of these terms to be small. And actually, I will also want this term to be small. Uh, later on, we'll see. Um, and, and you know, it's not like this operator needs to be small in general, just the operator when applied to this initial state, right? And you don't have control over size, so let's say it needs to be small for every um, psi here, so it needs, for this initial theta, this thing needs to be small, okay? But this, we looked before at what this is, right? So, um, we can write it in terms of that sum there, and in particular, the condition that we get, let me write it down, is Ah, it's the one that Rolf has there, so if g over h bar n of ak uh, n l b applied on eta. The thing, because when when you have the i applied on on psi, we saw that you can split it in this form so that you get these terms here, and you get the ak's, and then you have the ak on the other side, okay? And if this thing is small, small enough, we'll see how much, then this whole thing is going to be uh, super small, and we can neglect it. Okay? So this needs to be small for all the eigenvalues. It we'll look later at what this is. Yeah? A acts on the first system, B acts on the second. No, no. A acts on S. Oh, sorry. Ah, the exponent, yes. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you can try to convince yourself that if that thing is small, then this thing is going to be tiny and you can neglect it. Okay. So, we'll do this approximation, right? So, we get this. This is just plus order of. Yeah. Good. So now let's see what happens now to the post-selected state, approximately. So we just rewrite what we did before. So now, after post-selection, enter, move T, And we say this is approximately, so now one over square root of, uh, I forgot it here, one over square root of P. So now we just replace this with this, right? So we have Minus IG uh, over H bar, and now I have this. A, I guess, tuck, N 
on the other side, I have yeah, the M. All right. I did not forget anything. Okay, so this is what? One over square root of P. Here, I just have times. So this is now Australian system M. And here, um, I have this thing, which I will now multiply and divide by this. We know that this cannot be zero for the sets we are interested in. Right, for these logical printful selection paradoxes, the printful selection must have some overlap. So I'll just put it here. For free. What we get? One over square root of P. Now we have this. You know what we have inside here? Identity minus IG ridge bar. And here we have BM. This whole thing applied here. Okay. Now, This thing here, we give it a name. We call it AW, so this whole thing. And we call this the weak value of the observable AS given, given the pre and post selection. Because look, I mean, this only depends really on the pre-selection, the post-selection, and the observable that is measured. There's nothing here that depends on the pointer. Good. So now we make another approximation, which is very similar to this. So I'll rewrite here, maybe in a different color so that you can see. So I want to say that E to minus I G H bar E W B M ETA Okay. Is approximately this. Plus if I were to write the whole thing, this would be, you get here all the second order terms. Okay, so, uh, to the n. Okay, so, this is what I have there inside the thing, right? Hmm? And now I want to write this thing again as if it was the exponential because it will be useful for later. Which means that in order to do this, it, it means that I should be able to uh, neglect all the second or, or the terms, right? It, and for that, I mean, in particular, I need that this thing is, is also small in itself. Uh, as you'll see, especially for the case of pre and post selection paradoxes, th this thing um, can be outside the range of eigenvalues of the observable, so it's a, it's a new condition. So I'll just write it there. I want that thing to be small, not for any state, but at least when applied to this state. So I want G over H bar AW, at least the absolute value in here. I want this to be small. Okay. So now we take it to be small. 
And we just replaced that thing there with the... Um, with the exponential, so what we have now is this state is approximately 1 over square root of p. Uh, that thing, and now mm -hmm. where is it? Yeah e to minus i g over h bar. This number, it's a complex number in general. Uh, our bm, all this applied to state. Huh? Uh, yeah, so what does this tell us already that I have this complicated state, which is a superposition of all these things, but I can approximate it by just but it's applying this operator to the, to the initial state. Okay? In the case of, um, of the point that is a particle in a line, this thing here is going to be the momentum. So this corresponds to the kind of just, when I do this post-selection, it's like my original wave function was here, and now I just shifted it by this amount, uh, AW, uh, G. Okay, of course that's not the exact state, right? Because, I mean, yeah, it is a superposition of many things, but in this approximation, it looks approximately like this. Um, good. These two terms, now we see that they cancel out again in this approximation because, uh, yeah. So what's P? I could just say norm of this, but for some reason, I like to, it's probability that the post-selection succeeds. So on this, but this thing, we said that this is approximately the identity applied to these two things minus ig over h bar, a applied to the first, b applied to the second, right. Okay, so then when we place this here, well, should we do it? So we can do this, oh, why not? Oh, I forgot the, sorry. Complex conjugate. Okay, oh. good. So, you plug this in here, you get that, and what you get is minus 2g over h bar, and then you get kind of, I'm very slow at writing, so you can use this time to derive this by yourselves, otherwise it's in the notes. Okay. This is the thing where you do just, you just compute the density matrix, multiply with this, blah, blah. Um, good. This term, 
is going to be zero just because we choose. Yeah, maybe I can write it down even. We're free to choose both eta and bm, and you can choose it such that this this initial value is zero. This is what happens in the Gaussian case. Okay. In other cases, uh, it could be that you know it's not zero, but the imaginary part is zero. So let me write it here. Let's see. That's only assumption. Good. All right, so then when you do this thing, then up to a phase, if you neglect that term and neglect this term, then up to a phase, this is just e to minus i d h bar a w. Possibly with a phase. Good. So where are we in the measuring scheme? So now we know what the state is here at this point. Right? And now we want to measure this observable C here and see what the outcome is. Oh. Mm. And remember, we're thinking of doing this experiment many, many times. I, I don't care about all the statistics, and for now, I care only about the average. So. Um, and this is why that phase there doesn't matter, because when you put the thing in the complex conjugate, then, then the P really cancels out with that thing there. So you get just this, E to I, G, over h bar, a w b, b. Okay. All right, so if I wanted to be like super correct, I'd put here a phase. And the e two i theta is cancel out when you do this. <laughs> Good. So now, I mean, we said nothing so far about this observable c, right? So this for now still could be anything. Um, but now here comes a nice, um, nice thing. So again, we can choose a, b, c, no, b, c, and the initial state, and we choose the observables. Such that uh, okay. CM evaluated in the state E to let's say minus I delta. Delta is now everything. B on my initial state. Now, for now, this looks like a very contrived condition, but we'll see later how to derive this from something very simple. Okay. I'll just want to show you that uh, here already, uh, you already get this. So in particular, for example, if B and C are on a line, the position and momentum, then you get this for free, right? Because what this does is to shift my wave function 
by this amount delta. So when I then compute the position, it's the original position on average plus this amount delta. Okay. So I'll write this condition here on the right. So CM evaluator E. Evaluation on theta. Good. So I mean, if we do this, if we pick this rule, I can erase it now because it's there. Then I say that this is just my CM on my original state, like it's there, plus G is a number, and then the real part of this weak value. And now, again, I'm free to choose this state, right? Whatever state I choose, I can just shift it on the line or shift my coordinate system so that um, this value is zero for the initial thing. Okay, so I'll just put it here. It's another condition. But th this is very easy to obtain, right? This is really just like relabeling your observables or shifting your state in the lab or whatever, right? So I get G. Good. Uh, yeah. By the way, one can then one can also choose a different observable here that has a different property. So, for example, if instead of position here you measured momentum, then you get a function here of the imaginary part of AW. So this is written on the notes, but I, I don't think we need to go through this in the thing. Okay. So then what do we have here? So now we have all these conditions. We repeat this thing many, many times. Okay, and at the end we get the statistics that we post selected already, and we know the average value of C. This is just G times the real part of AW. Okay. We can pick another value, another C here, so that we get this imaginary part of AW, so some C prime. Okay. Which means that if we do this many, many times, then we recover this value AW. And what was AW? Okay, AW was precisely this. Uh, now, this is something that you would not be able to obtain by just doing a projective measurement here, right? Because this disturbs the state too much, and then the what happens here with the post-selection is strange. And so w what you, you kind of measure, manage to get from here is really the, the probabilities as if you had done one measurement and then the other, but without disturbing the state. Uh, you know, we can choose this AW, Sorry, we can choose this A to always be just, um, which is what we'll do next. So we can choose this measurement to be just a projector and identity minus a projector. And this corresponds to eigenvalue 1, and this corresponds to eigenvalue 0. And then in this case, what you get here uh, is related to the probabilities of getting this thing. That, that's what we'll do now. Okay. So through weak measurements, we can measure this weak value of an observable. If this weak value is outside the spectrum of the observable, we say it's anomalous. So now we look at the special case of this um, logical paradoxes. Okay. So far, 
Do it with me. Good. All right. Okay. So remember, in the paradoxes, it was kind of this this thing where in the intermediate measurement. It also it was always about um, one projector, or it was always a binary projective measurement, right? So this is my M. So then we we just draw the this corresponds to an observable, for example, which will be P plus something one minus P. And now we can choose the eigenvalues however we want, right? As long as they're real, then this is a valid observable. So we just do one here and zero there. So our observable is just P. It's just a projector. And then, we just say, well, we need to define this function f of p. And we just say, well, this is going to be uh, 1 over g, whatever I measure here, after doing this whole procedure, the average value of this thing, right? Which we saw there. Well, this is the real part of the weak value associated with this observable. This is what? Let's write it down again. Uh. Okay. So this is one thing that we define, given the, the, the statistics that we do, the measurement. This is something we can check in the lab. Now, if you remember these ABL probabilities, yeah. So this was the probability of getting this outcome, conditioned on the fact that I had my preselection, that I did this measurement. Oh. Yeah. And, and I did this preselection, all on S. Yeah. This is a similar number, but it's not exactly the same. Oh, a in this case is this piece, so I can just put this in. Uh, and here, it was the probability that the post selection works at all when we do this intermediate measurement. Now, what's the main difference between them? I mean, apart from this being the real part and being the square root of that, uh, apart from all that, like the, the denominator is very similar. The denominator is different because here is like the probability that the post selection works when you do this intermediate protective measurement, right? And this is the probability that the, if you do the square, the probability that the post selection works when we do nothing in the middle. Okay. And that makes sense because in this regime of weak measurement, what we do is disturb the state on S very, very little. Right? So that then this is um, yeah. approximately, it was approximately uh, that thing. Right? Now, We saw that this thing in general did not satisfy all these algebraic conditions, uh, but this thing will because the denominator does not depend on the, on the projector. So let's see this.
So let's check. Do you remember we had these four conditions for being a logical uh, print post selection paradoxes? You should have two violations of them. So. For logical. So the first one is that for all p in my initial uh, set of projectors, we need f of p of being one. So what are the p's that are in my initial set of projectors? They are the ones for which this probability is one. Okay. So. Probability of P given mm. right. So at least for the measurements that we um, yeah that that are checked in the new strong measurement case, like this thing should match the probabilities. Uh, right, and this is true because if this thing is one, but then this thing here must be zero, right? Because it's A over A plus B equals one, so B needs to be zero. Right, so, so from probability of P given all of these things equals one, we did the top is equals to the bottom, which means the bottom is zero. Sorry, not the bottom, the right side of the bottom is here. Good. Uh, for the absolute value of a thing to be zero, then the thing itself needs to be zero. Right, so then you have this is zero. And now everything is linear, so you get zero equals so then when you compute f of p real part of this thing Then you can just replace here. Oh, you can replace in the bottom or the top. I have to write less if I do it like this. So. Okay, this is just fine. Okay. So it does match the ABL probabilities for this for the states in in, in this original set of measurements. Right. Then what were the other conditions? So we needed, this is condition one. No, sorry, this is condition two. One will not be satisfied. So one is at f of one. This should be one, but this is just, again, real part of identity. Uh, and because the denominator is not zero, and this is one, F of zero. And again, this is very important. The denominator is not zero, right? Because in logical pre and post selection paradoxes, this need to overlap. Uh, and the other one we do after the break. Um, yeah, can continue even there. The end of the lecture will be a bit interactive because we are proving some things as we go along. This is advanced topics. Uh, so we might need your help. Then. Okay, so the last condition that we want to check is that if they commute, if the projectors commute, they are in the larger algebra than uh, F 
of P plus Q minus PQ. This should be F of P plus F of Q minus F of PQ. So this whole thing, it's a bit horrible, but real part of P plus Q minus PQ. divided by this number. Now, these are all complex numbers, and I don't know, and that's just me, I don't know how to divide by complex numbers to get very confused, so I just rewrite this as real part of, I just multiply at the top and bottom by the complex conjugate of this, so. But I get this, and now here on top I get P plus Q minus F. So with that, and this looks linear. Um, yeah. And it is linear. So I'll just put here the ingredient, which, if all of these things are complex numbers, this is the real part of alpha beta plus the real part of alpha gamma, I think at least, as I did it. So then you just get that that whole thing is just you expand, then you 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 gobble up this this term that's on top now goes back to the bottom, so you get again so uh, juke p right I mean you'd get here this divided by the absolute value. You get this, but now I can just rewrite this again as that thing. Okay, plus all the other terms. Okay, so this is just f of p plus the same term for F of Q minus F of PQ. Okay. So, uh, what does this tell us so far? So we have, we found a function that satisfies the, the main condition, which is that it's matched, uh, where's the zero? It matches the ABL probabilities for our original projectors. It satisfies uh, this two algebraic conditions, right? And that's essentially like this last rule works well because the denominator is the same no matter what the projector you put on top. So you can do this linear expansions. Um, okay, but if we have a paradox, uh, then you know that it cannot satisfy all three, right? So if you have, for example, in, in the Hardy case, or in the pigeons case, if there's a paradox, this means that the Arab uh, thing is not satisfied. So we, we have that there exists projectors in my larger algebra such that f of p is smaller than zero or f of p is larger than one because it's, it's a, this would be the other condition that we didn't check. All right, so if all the other conditions are, are true, then this must be the one that, that fails. 
And indeed, so this, no, no, what is the spectrum of A? So, of A is, you can get zero, one. Yeah. And anomalous weak values is when anomal, is when uh, is when a w does not belong to this to this interval so let's say the uh, what's this called in maths the convex you take a bunch of you take a bunch of points and you take the com all the convex combinations of them convex hull yes that's right convex hull of the spectrum of a This is when we call anomalous weak values. Uh, and in this case, it really corresponds to AW, well, being smaller than zero or um, larger than one. Or the other option that we didn't check here is that the imaginary part of is is non-zero, right? But so, what this tells us is, is that if there is a print post selection paradox, we can always detect this in the weak values. So if, at least if it's in one of these two cases, we can detect it with this measurement. If it's uh, this case, we'll have to detect it with a with a different observable, a different observable C. Okay. So what this tells us is that if you have um, okay, yeah, if you have a logical PPS paradox, you can always detect it via anomalous weak values. Good. And then from here, you can also go, you can say, oh, so if I see anomalous weak values in this paradox, in this pre and post selection setting, then I know that it is a proof of contextuality. Right? So this is one way to prove contextuality with you know, something you can actually observe in the lab. Okay. There are other proofs that don't, that for which you can actually do Protective measurements, but this is nicely related to these things. So now we have all these conditions to satisfy, and this is still very abstract. So I'd like to uh, maybe explore them a little bit. Now, in extreme cases, this AW can be like, it can be really much, much larger than, than anything in the spectrum of A, right? You, you can make it such that this is like a thousand, for example. So this can be much, much, much larger, which is why, you know, this is the condition for all the values in the spectrum of A, and this for AW is much stronger in general, or can be much stronger, okay? So, yeah. Sorry. Like that? Oh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I don't know if you have the Hardy paradox example, Nuria. Is this in a tutorial? Yeah. No, okay, yeah. Maybe next week. Uh, yeah, so if you compute them actually for like Hardy's paradox, the the weak values you get is, remember, I think it was in lecture 22, uh, that we computed what f of p was 
in those cases and you got some negative values or, or equals two, for example, and this is exactly what you'd measure. That's right. Good. Okay. Now. So, let's look at these conditions and what, it, what we need for this thing to be small. So, conditions. A1 and A2. So what we need is that uh, G over H bar A, this is like the norm, is small, and for A belongs to Right, for all the eigenvalues of the observable and the weak value as well. Okay. And it's funny because this don't depend on the print post selection, and this depends, yeah, on the print post selection. Good. Uh, right, so what's this thing? B is an observable, so it's equals a complex conjugate permission. Uh, good. And now we can write this so for any observable. What is this? Uh, or some states theta. Okay, so we can write this as a root of delta B minus the value of this observable B for my initial state, right? Uh, and this I said was zero. This is like the last condition. We said it's such that this is zero. So this is just um, delta B. Mm -hmm. So what we need is this G H bar A. Uh, Delta B needs to be very small. Hmm? Now, think again of the of the case where where we have the position the position thing, yeah. the position pointer. Uh, what did and say C is position and B is momentum, okay? What it means for the, moment, for the momentum uncertainty to be small, then it needs to be very spread out. The, the, the uncertainty on, uh, on X needs to be very large, right? It needs to be large compared to what? Well, compared to by how much this, kind of how much the thing will move, right? Because we said like the final, so if the initial state is here, then the final state, the post-selected state is approximately this, moved by amount g, you know, aw. For the aw, and for the superposition, like if you're looking at this, like before the post-selection, then it's all of this by, by this a case, right? By g a k. So we need it to be really spread out compared to um, how much it moves, right? That's why I, s I said in the beginning that like in the strong 
in the strong measurement case, it corresponds to something that is parallel position and goes like to these states that are orthogonal. And in the weak measurement case, it really corresponds to something that stays like this, right? So this guarantees that there's still a lot of overlap between the initial state and the final state. Good. We'll do this now explicitly because I have a lot of time. For the Gaussian pointer, just because, well, if you need, it's good for you if I do Gaussians, right? Yeah. Did you get it? Yeah. Yeah, we're not there yet. OK. Uh, so example. This is just saying, well, mm, my BM is the momentum operator, OK? My CM is the position operator. And my initial state X is a Gaussian. So I'll put it here just for computing the other one. So this is our normalization. I'm pretty sure there's a an H bar missing here. Minus. This makes me nervous because there's no H bars. The H bar is in the momentum, right? Okay. So what are the properties of such a state? So the way we we design it, if it had a momentum, we would have to put here some another exponential on k and x. Um, I k x, like this. So we have that x for this thing. So this corresponds to an a, say, is x plus g a. Uh, sorry. Sorry, it's g a. What am I doing? So in particular, x of the initial state is 0. This is important because when I apply the, the momentum, it really shifts the thing. The uncertainty in position is this sigma squared for this state and for yeah, whatever you put here. And the position uncertainty is h bar square over 4 sigma squared. And the momentum, so this is all for either for the initial state or for the phi a, is zero, right? So the way we designed it for this initial point, this initial state, uh, it looks like this. Why the Gaussian, Ralph will talk more about this next week, but Gaussians are very nice because they're, if it's Gaussian in the position basis, it's also Gaussian in the momentum basis. And this makes this uh, translation very nice. Okay. Okay. This I'm just uh, reciting, but you can see already that it satisfies those conditions, the last condition. So. B is P, the initial momentum is zero, the initial uh, position is zero. And now, uh, 
if we compute that thing that we want to be small, then we have b over h bar a, which can be our aw or, or one of the eigenvalues, uh, delta p. This is just g h bar a h bar to sigma b a over two sigma. Right. So, yeah. So we want that for the initial Gaussian. Yeah, that two sigma is much larger than g a. So g a is the amount by which it will move, right? And we need, yeah. and we need it to be, um, yeah, much smaller than the uncertainty. Good. You'll see other examples of, of pointers that are not continuous in the tutorial. And you can try to compute this for them too. Now let's look at the other condition. And I trust Rolf to tell me when when I get to the critical part that we hadn't worked out until 10 minutes ago, okay? Uh. Did you take it? I know, yeah. So now we want to know, well, what are the relation between C and B and eta, such that when I act with it, which is exponential of b, it really like shifts the average uh, position by some by some amount. Right? And this is exactly the case. You'll prove it in the tutorial. I said it last week, but it's exactly the case. What happens when, when here you have uh, the position? Right? So for condition b, and this is important because you know it tells you what kind of systems I can use to build with measurements. It doesn't always need to be just this pointer in a line. So suppose that we have this thing. So what is this? This kind of a weakening of, a, of asking for, this, for these two variables to be conjugate variables. So if you remember from quantum mechanics one, this commutator is I h times the identity, right? Uh, now we don't ask that, it, that these two variables are like this in general, and this is, I mean, you cannot achieve this for discrete systems easily, but for some states, which are the states that I'll choose for the initial state as a pointer, it, it will act as if they are conjugate, okay? So this will be the case. I think Ralph will talk about this next week. Uh, if I have, instead of a line, I have a, a discrete ladder, I do it like a circle, right? And then I choose my initial state to be um, like a, okay, it's a circle, now I put it on a line, okay. And I take my initial state to be like a Gaussian, but of course it's just discrete probabilities because it's a discrete system, but it's like, as if it was sampled from a Gaussian, uh, then it will have this property. Okay. So anything that approximates a Gaussian essentially will have this for some observables. So whenever they're kind of the Fourier transform of each other, if they're the exact Fourier transform of each other, this is true for all states because we just get that. In the discrete case, you get the, they can be the discrete Fourier transform of each other. Uh, and then it can still be true for some states and these are the useful states. Yeah. Because then we'll see that in this case, that condition is satisfied. So 
Now I want to compute C for this final state. B, I like carrying the edge bars around. So this is E, I, delta star. Delta, I said, can be a complex number because um, it will be in particular the AW, which is complex. B over H bar. C, I, delta, B over H bar. Okay. And I'll focus on this side here. Oh, no delta star already? Uh, but that's sad. <laughs> okay, so I tell you what, we did this, and when we got to the end, uh, I got delta, not the real part of delta. So we've been looking into this, and it could be that we need to use the other assumption in the middle. Hmm? If I do it to first row, but, oh, okay, okay. So we need them together, right? But then I need to pick the minimum uncertainty. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Should I just write this then? You'd kill it off already now? Already? Already now? So sad. <laughs> okay. If you want to see the whole thing, then you can see the. Uh, here, so let's do it. All right, so identity plus I. Oh. I mean, this thing, it's already there from the first assumptions, right? From the assumptions A. Right? So what I did before, and it's in, in the notes, which I might not give you because of that, is really to, okay, I... I write this in terms of the commutator plus the other way around, and then I, I go and solve this. Exactly. But then... Yeah. What does it give me? Yeah. 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 So that's true when when this is not a complex number. Yeah. So that that's what I did. I mean, I derived the, the thing, and yeah. So we use a uh, fine. This plus I B C this that's this term with that plus Minus I delta H bar. Uh, CB. Plus. Hmm?
Don't tell me you just neglect that. Yeah, in fact, I mean, we can neglect this because it, it's what he used for this too, right? But yeah, that's fair enough. Okay. So this is the thing we wanted already. And here you get exactly this thing. Right? So, no, you still have the, yeah. Of this guy? This. There we go. So now, so we have the thing we wanted. Okay, just write real of delta over h bar. There are two missing here somewhere? Hmm? Look, I need to get a pause at the end too. But at the end, Right, so if I, if, I, if I change this already, then I can get rid of a minus sign. Right? Okay. And now, uh, for imaginary part of this thing, and here I get. Probably. So there's a minus here. I need a minus. But I already swapped the B and the C. This makes me very uncomfortable. Okay. Okay, so wait, for this, we pick this such that the anti commutator is zero. And an example of this is the, the Gaussian wave packets that we've seen before, correct? This thing somehow will simplify. Ah, yes, no, yeah, that's right. Yeah, because now I have the I there, okay. Took, took, plus h bar cancels out with the h bar, and then I just have real part of this. Good. Yeah, now it's when I want to to this. Good. Okay, good, so now it works. Which means that we can replace this 
thing. That, yeah, I think now it works, right? Okay, good. So this means that this was a very abstract kind of wishful thinking condition, right? This is what, how we want it to happen. Anticommutator of B and C is the same as C and B, right? And now we can replace it with something that we can actually, you know, check in theory before going to the lab. So we want to pick these two observables in the state such that B, C applied to the state is I, H bar this. And the anticommutator applied to the state Is here. Right. Does it need to be zero or the you just need this to be zero, right? That's a weaker condition. Yeah. See if I can zero. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Oh, that's a weaker condition, right? Good. So these are all things that you can tune before going to the lab and making your weak measurements, right? Maybe it's, you need to change your pointer system, but this you can choose whatever system you want, right? You can, as long as you can build this interaction physically, which might be a complicated engineering problem, right? Um, but, you know, once you have the B and the Cs, it's not always obvious how to go in the lab and build this Hamiltonian. Uh, right. Okay, but the conditions you need is that they act as if they were conjugate variables, at least for this uh, initial state of the pointer, and that the average value of the anticommutator is zero, which is true for the states of minimum uncertainty, of which the, um, the Gaussians are examples. And I just wanted to give a few more examples that at least satisfy the first condition before I let you go. You know, if you get here, not not exactly this commutator, but any multiple of this, that's also okay. You can still you can still work with it. So, the examples. So, like I said, XP, and then taking this to be Gaussian. Uh, in discrete systems. We take x to be the computational basis, and then we take p. Sorry, so this is x, and then take p to be the, um, uh, the discrete free transform of the other. Okay, which I think you've seen, for example, in the QIP one classes, and Rob will talk about this next time, and then you take this delta to be kind of a discrete Gaussian. Then it will also satisfy these properties. And this is not only useful for weak measurements, but also useful for quantum clocks, right? Which is what you'll cover next week. Good. But the other example I've seen in the tutorial is when our pointer is just one qubit. Okay. So. Then you can also get this approximately approximately, uh, by using poly operators. So take mm -hmm. so take your B to B, for example, uh, right, the other way. Ah, you know what I mean. Poly X operator. 
uh, and take care of C to be such. Poly Z operator. If you do with the polys, it's the same. You just get a different um, factor there, but then you know that Z X sigma Y. This is very much not the identity, but if I take the initial state to be um, ether to be plus I, which is the eigenvalue of this thing, so sorry, Y. Then I get that when I have this, apply the state plus i. Then this is approximately it's like i, some constant plus i. Because yeah. you get this extra over 2, maybe there's an over 2 here, I don't know. We get an over two here, which means that then when it shifts, it doesn't shift exactly by G A, but it shifts by G over two A H bar. Yes? Yeah, and, and exactly, and it also has this nice property of that X plus I is zero. Uh, and this is nice because normally we see examples of weak measurements with this, uh, with this, uh, you know, very large system, a, a particle on a line, and it looks like there's something special about con continuous dimensions that we need to have a very large pointer to do it, but in fact we can do most of it uh, with just a qubit pointer. We just need to be much more careful about what initial states we choose and so on. So this you compute Essentially, we compute um, how to make the weak version of a Z measurement on a qubit by using another qubit and doing, instead of doing like a C naught, uh, you do this soft rotation. Okay. Good, so that's it. I am now free. Uh, yeah, so what did we do? We started looking at strange puzzles, we found a way to systematize them, we related them to contextuality, and now we related them to something that is experimentally of value and can be checked. Okay. And now this is a segue for Ralph next week to talk about clocks, which will also be related to this thermodynamics of this resource series. When I said, oh, now we can like harshen a bit the resource theory and say, well, we don't get unitaries for free, unitaries cost you know, we need to use a clock to know for how long to apply a Hamiltonian. We need to account for this. And that's what uh, Ralph will talk about next week. Okay. Good. Thanks. Have a good lunch.